I, uh, I work on a statistic, statistical mechanics and uh, probability, and I, and I know that it's a different language than <laughs> many of you are used to. And uh, so I want to spend just a couple minutes uh, saying where the problems come from. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to talk about s some uh, particular algebraic integral systems which arise in this Dimer model. So, and this is joint work with uh, my co-author uh, uh, Sasha Goncharov, who's at Yale. So um, in uh, statistical mechanics, we're interested in making models of matter and studying phase transitions and these kind of things. And in particular, uh, uh, in interacting particle systems. So we have large systems of, of particles which are interacting in, in various ways. And there are many. Uh, sort of models which uh, are considered. Some of them are, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's very easy to write down uh, some basic in interaction model of matter. But uh, of course, uh, understanding them mathematically is, is very difficult. And the, uh, the few models which are most successful uh, are, are the ones which have some underlying algebraic structure in the background uh, underlying the model. And the, in particular, the, the, uh, there's often some sort of integrability hiding or uh, not immediately obvious in the, uh, in the model, which allows us to uh, solve, in, in, in quotes, the model in the sense of making some exact calculations. And, uh, It's not easy to, to, to find such models, but uh, there, there are a few models which, few models which have been you know, successfully studied this way. One is the Ising model that was uh, you know, solved in the 40s. Uh, that's, a, that's a model for magnetism. Um, and the model I want to talk about is the Dimer model. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very simple model which uh, on a graph. So we have a graph G. Uh, let, let's call it gamma is a graph. Um, you, you know, you can think of the graph, uh, a finite graph or an infinite graph, let, uh, and uh, if we're talking about matter, we, we can think of sort of a it being a periodic graph, and, and I'm going to think about a planar graph because we really don't know how to do anything beyond two dimensions, and in one dimension it's boring. so. Uh, what is the dimer model? Uh, so a dimer, dimer uh, cover of gamma is a it's a it's a set of edges, which uh, cover all the vertices, uh, each vertex being covered exactly once. Okay. All right. So it's a. a so it's is a. As illustrated here, so it's just a perfect matching, perfect matching. If you're a computer scientist, this is called a perfect matching, uh, uh, i.e., set of edges covering all the vertices. How, how is this related to any sort of model for matter? That's that's. Uh, Another, 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 maybe less obvious question, but uh, but uh, you can imagine having some sort of uh, crystal substrate, and you you pour some some other molecules on some diatomic molecules on top, and each diatomic molecule li like. Uh, each diatomic molecule falls onto the crystal in some uh, arrangement of, uh, of uh, 
occupying two positions in the lattice. Okay, so it's it's a it's it's a very simple model of I interaction where the interaction is just every neighbor or every every vertex wants to pair to a neighbor. <coughs> so that's the and and that's the object we want to study on a on a periodic planar graph. Okay, seems like a very simple model. Uh, there are, of course, lots of questions you can ask about it, uh, uh, but you know the the goal of this talk is 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 not going to be so much about these questions, but the underlying algebraic uh, structure, uh, sort of hiding behind this this uh, model, and so um, what I want to do is so historically, you know th this. This model was studied in this, in the, you know, sort of solved via some determinants in the, in back in the 60s by Castellin and Temperley and Fisher, and uh, in the 90s some combinatorialists, combinatorialists got interested in various count, counting the number of dimer covers of various kinds of graphs, uh, and they, 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 there's some very interesting uh, computations, some exact computations for large families of graphs. <coughs> and we, we discovered at some point that there was this, uh, there's this uh, algebraic integral system hiding, hiding behind, and that's what I want to explain today. So uh, here's the uh, here's the sort of uh, uh, the goal is to uh, th what I want to describe today is this uh, system. So we're going to start with gamma, a graph. A bipartite planar, no, a bipartite, yeah, graph on a torus on T two, and uh, from that I'm gonna I'm gonna build this uh, algebraic integral system. Hamiltonian uh, integral system. Here, and but but the the uh, there's some uh, certainly equivalence equivalence uh, of graphs which all lead to the same system and the the um, the everything is controlled. I mean the 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 real parameters of the system are all being controlled by a single choice of a polygon, an integer polygon. So. Really, the starting point is going to be an integer uh, polygon, convex. I mean, a polygon with integer vertices here. And from this integer polygon, we're going to build a graph, or rather, some finite equivalence class of graphs. So, uh, bipartite graphs on the two torus and each of those, for each of such graphs, has an algebraic system, and if the two graphs are equivalent, then these systems are essentially uh, Poisson uh, equivalent in the appropriate sense. And uh, here we can start with an arbitrary convex polygon. So uh, you can think of the, the fundamental object is you start with a polygon, you get a system. With, okay. Um, so here's the, now I can tell you the outline of the talk. So I, I'm going to first tell you about the dimer model a little bit more. The, the Hamiltonians in the the Hamiltonians of the integral system are, are sums of dimers on, on the graph. Uh, then I have to tell you about the uh, Poisson structure, which is controlling the uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. And uh, then I can, you can tell you what the Hamiltonians are. I have to tell you all, all the various pieces that go into the construction of this Hamiltonian, Liouville Hamiltonian system, Liouville integral system. 
And then I'm going to talk about the equivalence, which is discussed here, and the polygon uh, here at the at the end. And in the end, and, and at the end, if I have time, I will uh, make some uh, uh, talk about the Beauville integral system. Sort of give the the identification of these systems with these special ki kinds of integral systems called Beauville integral systems. Okay, here here's a, a periodic planar graph. Um, what I'm going to deal with in this talk is a is just the quotient of that by, by the uh, tr translation. So I'm going to talk about a graph on a torus. So here's my torus, uh, T2, which is, which is 0, 1 squared. And I have a graph on this torus. Let's, let, let me take a particular example here. Uh, that graph there. Bipartite graph means just that the, that the vertices come in two colors, black and white, black and white, and the edges only go between vertices of, of different colors, okay? <coughs> now, uh, uh, I'm going to put some parameters. That somewhere there has to be some parameters in the problem, and the parameters are part of the difficulty in the, is that the, there are various ways, equivalent ways to parameterize the the, the model, and the most natural one is to just put edge weights on the edges, put numbers on the edges of the graph. So nu is a, is a map from the edges, edge of the graph to, uh, well, if we're doing uh, physics, we want positive real weights, but uh, everything I'm going to be talking about is algebraic here, so, so uh, you might as well just think of them as non-zero complex numbers, okay? So the, the physically meaningful weights are real and positive. But uh, uh, and when we have these edge weights, we can we, – so let's let M is the set of uh, dimer covers of our graph gamma. So gra gamma is this, this particular graph here. It can be any graph. Uh, in this case, there are eight dimer covers. Let me just draw one for you. Uh, I can put that edge, and, and, and then this edge can go that way. Okay, that's one of the eight dimer covers of that particular graph. Uh, and to each dimer, to each dimer cover, I can, I can, I assign a weight, which is the product of the weights of the edges. Okay, so the, the weight of M, and so for M is an M. The weight of M is the product over the edges, which are in the dimer cover of the of the weight. Right, a dimer cover is a dimer is a dimer cover of the graph. It's just a collection of edges, a subset of the edges of this graph, which covers a, such that each vertex is an endpoint of exactly one edge. Covering all vertices, you know, exactly once. So each vertex is an endpoint of exactly one edge. Uh, okay, and uh, in physics, you can think of the weight as e to the minus the energy. Sorry, nu of uh, the edge e is exp of minus some energy which you associate to that edge E. And uh, uh, edges which have a very low energy tend to be preferred because the dimer, dimer likes to be in its uh, lo low energy state. If you want to put a temperature in, yeah, you can put a temperature in. But uh, uh, we're, uh, Right, so if 
And, and then the, the product of the weights is just the exp of minus the sum of the energies, okay, associated with that. So you can think of that uh, sort of a, a, a random configuration a, a, a on M, a random dimer cover of M where the probabilities are proportional to e to the minus energy. But uh, for us, uh, uh, now let's just use this formula. And the, the important, physically important quantity is the partition function, which is the sum. So the uh, important physically quantity is the sum of the weights of over, is the sum over all dimer covers of the weight. Right, it, it, if you want, it's just a polynomial, it's a certain polynomial in the edge weights. In edge weights. Well, uh, but it's just a number and we can make a slightly more more interesting quantity by recording not just the weight of a dimer cover, but its homology class. Okay, so uh, if, uh, if I have two dimer covers like that, ah, the, the, the orange one there and maybe this blue one, right? And when I draw them on top of one another, I get this, these cycles. And, and, the, and the, I can associate a homology class to a pair of, of dimer covers. So if, if we fix uh, a base, base point, uh, uh, a base point I mean, the, what, what should I call it? The base point dimer cover M naught. Then, when I take any other dimer cover, I can I can draw it simultaneously with M naught and get and get a homology class. Then, then uh, if I take a, a, any other M and I uh, superimpose it with M naught, uh, well. So let's let M naught be the blue one here. And if I, I, I direct, I, I, have to, I have to put some direction. So let's direct the blue edges from the black, from the white vertex to the black vertex. And uh, I'll direct the yellow edges uh, in the reverse way from the black to the white. All right, so then every, every vertex has one incoming edge and one outgoing edge, and so those are going to form cycles, and I can take the homology class of that cycle. So let me put an M naught uh, bar to say that th this, is, this is the one directed from black to white, this is or white to black, and black to white, and, and this has a particular homology class in the torus, right? Which, which gives me a pair of integers associated to every, every dimer cover, okay? So for every dimer cover, once I made the choice of M naught, I, I, I get a, an integer, a pair of integers. And so, so, so we can make this more fa fancier partition function, which now depends on two, two uh, variables, two, two other variable z and w, which is the sum over all dimer covers, is the, it's just the generating function of the homology class. So it's the weight, the weight of m times z to the i w to the j, where uh, you know m union m naught bar is this 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 homology class i j. just a sum of dimer covers with some extra weights and, and uh, uh, it's not relevant for this talk but, but uh, for various reasons we throw in a sign 
here. So let me just say not relevant <laughs> here. But when you throw in that sign, this is, this, this is called the characteristic polynomial. Uh, so z of z and w is the characteristic polynomial. And what does it depend on? It depends on the graph and the weights. Uh, depends on uh, gamma and the weights. And it also depends on this choice of, of uh, base point dimer cover. But if we change the base point dimer cover, the, the whole thing gets multiplied by a monomial anyway. So it essentially does not depend on the, uh, I mean, projectively it does not depend on M naught. So this is going to play the role of our spectral curve. The, the, the zero set of this polynomial is going to be our spectral curve. Let me do this way. Oh, OK. So now I can tell you about the polygon, right? The polygon which belongs over here. I started with a graph, and I'm going to tell you how to, I, I'm going to, tell you how to construct the polygon from the graph. And then uh, the reverse procedure is, is, a, is a little bit more complicated. But uh, <coughs> at least you can see it in, in one direction. So what's the polygon? Well, there's only, there's only one way to, I mean, it's an obvious way to associate an integer polygon to a polynomial, which is to take the Newton polygon, so n, so we associate a polygon n, which is the Newton polygon of, of z, this is a polynomial. It's really a Laurent polynomial because some of the exponents could be negative. So this is the convex hull of the set of ij, which are, homo which are homology classes uh, of dimer covers. So the, the, the ij, which occur in this sum, ij, where z to the i wj is a uh, term monomial. So in, in, in the example, which I unfortunately erased, <coughs> we had, uh, well, I don't know, I'm just going to draw something else. Probably not what, what I wrote originally, but uh, we had this guy. And uh, well, let me just, so, so in, this, in this example, the Newton polygon is uh, this particular diamond shape, right? So this is the, like the origin here, 1, 0, 0, 1. <coughs> well, why is the origin included? I mean, it, I can always, it, it, if, m, if m equals m naught, then uh, every curve there's, then there's no homology. Every curve is just sort of goes back and forth. Uh, but uh, if I have a, a dimer cover like this one, no, that's not a good example. If I, if I have a dimer, dimer cover like that one, so this, this one, this curve goes back and forth, but this one goes forward and then forward, so it, so it goes around once. So that corresponds to this point here. And you can do that in, in any direction. OK. So now at least you understand, if I have a graph on the torus, I can make this polynomial and get its, get its uh, polygon, the associated polygon. And the, the, the way back is, well, if I have time, I'll, I'll tell you some more about that later. Please. Yes. Does not depend on these two guys. 
So this golden code is going to be get changed by uh, translation with DMCC. Is it true that it's going to be created on the smaller system as well? That's correct. That's correct. So you're going to have immense issues with the mess. That's right. I, if I, if I uh, change the fundamental domain here, this is just going to change by SL2Z, and the polygon will change by SL2Z. So we should consider those to be equivalent. Uh, um, okay, that should that should go under this. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, uh, so let me tell you about the conjugate graph now. So this is going to tell us where the where the Poisson structure comes from. So uh, when I have a when I have a graph on a surface, uh, that's not what I want to draw. If I have a graph on a surface, I can puncture put a puncture in every face, and think of the graph as a ribbon graph. Uh, right. So so my my surface is a I can con contract the surface down to the graph so that the, so that the, uh, uh, well, along every edge it looks like a ribbon, and the ribbons are glued uh, in a circular order uh, around each vertex. So this is the, this is the ribbon graph associated to my original embedding of gamma in my torus, right? And uh, what I want to do is, is define a new ribbon graph by reversing the orientation, reversing the, uh, putting a twist in along every edge. If I twist my my uh, surface at, at once at every edge, right? So the uh, I get a new surface. A, uh, a priori has nothing to do with the previous surface. Okay, so this is the this is called the conjugate surface. Conjugate. It's a it's it's a the graph has not changed, but I've twisted the the ribbon structure. Which, which is equivalent to, if you like, uh, reversing the orientation at all the black vertices. Conjugate uh, surface. Uh, wait a minute. So, so the graph, the, the, the graph is the, the, the hard lines, right? The graph is the hard lines here. Yeah. And the and surface. These other things are just. That's, are, that's are the, sort of the edge of the surface, right? You can imagine that. So what I take is I take my graph, which is embedded in my torus, and I, I'm going to put a puncture in each face. Right, and I so widen that. Here's the puncture in this graph here. here here's the well. I mean, I widen right. the puncture. Those are punctures. I widen the puncture until the until the until the ribbon it, it's like a ribbon following the the graph itself. You, you puncture every every face. I punct puncture every face. I put a puncture in every face. So every face of the of the graph I, on the I, torus. I, I, um, so I have a, I have a bunch of these loops in my on my torus, right? If you yes. Get my and, I, and as I, when I widen the loops, the the I get a uh, I get this ribbon graph structure, which is the, the it's a surface, which is which at the moment it's a punctured torus, but but it has the property that you know it it, uh, it looks like this. It follows the graph, uh, and and it's de so defined. So this, this is the this is the bare graph. I mean, this would be like the if I were just looking at the you know Cartesian. Lattice. Yes. I, I would just be putting a hole in every in every little plaquette. That's yes, all. that's right. That's all. That's all I'm doing. Nothing, nothing fancy okay, so there. So then I have, then I have some kind of a funny, yeah. It's just a, it, it's a, it's a. So in this it, case, it's well, just a puncture. You got a lot of puncture, so you got a lot of homology and all. That's that. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's a deformation. I mean, th the surface deformation retracts to the graph. Okay. Okay. <laughs> nothing fancy there. Okay. But when I reverse the when I when I put this twist in, the the number of boundary components changes, right? Because uh, you know this this boundary component 
uh, is now glued to that guy, which is glued to that guy, and so on. So uh, whereas the original surface was just a punctured torus, yeah. this is going to be some potentially higher genus surface, the conjugate surface. And what, what will it be? It's going to be a genus G surface, where G is the number of uh, interior points of the Newton polygon. That's, so a, that's that a lemma. Was, that was the same thing. Yeah. No. No, this is a, this, I started with a genus, you know, one surface, a torus. Yes. But actually for the whole of it, it's... Well, okay, but, but the topological genus is, is, you know, once you fill in the punctures, it's now a genus G surface. If I fill in the, if, if I, you know, these, these uh, new boundaries, once I uh, glue back it in oh, one okay. disk for each boundary, I get a new surface, which is a genus G surface. So what I'm... And G will be related to what? Uh, G is the number of... Well, uh, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but G is, G is the number of interior points in the Newton polygon. In this case, it'll be a genus one surface again, but uh, in a more general setting, it'll, it'll be a larger... larger. Uh, well... Uh, Okay, I should be following my notes because I, I, I skipped ahead. <laughs> so we need to talk a little bit more about the parameters. I said that our, our parameters were edge weights, weights on the edges. But uh, there's, there's a simple transformation if I take all the the weights at a single vertex and I multiply them by a constant. If my weights are a, b, c and I multiply them by some constant lambda at that vertex, uh, then the, the, uh, the polynomial that I've constructed only changes by multiplication by lambda. It changes by uh, uh, global multiplication by lambda because every every dimer cover uses exactly one of these three edges. Every dimer cover uses either that edge or that edge or that edge uh, and, and therefore its weight is getting multiplied by lambda. So this is called a, a gauge transformation. Where I, where I just multiply the edge weights at a, at a particular vertex by a constant. And of course, I can do this at all the other vertices as well. And uh, uh, so those parameters are somehow irrelevant uh, for, the, for the definition of Z. And they're, they're going to be irrelevant for the algebraic integral system as, as well. So I, I'm going to mod out by the gaze transformation. So if I look at the edge weights, edge weights, uh, you know, mod gauge transformations, Then, uh, well, uh, the dimension of the space is now the dimension of the cycle space. So it's the, uh, you know, so this is the you know, C star to the number of edges mod C star. Well, it's really vertices minus one because if I multiply everybody by the same constant, uh, well, anyway. There's going to be there's going to be the homology first homology of my graph with uh, well that is I, I'm going to have one parameter for each uh, element of the cycle space of my graph right which is going to be because I'm on a torus you can write this as the number of faces plus one, uh, which, uh, which is the homology of the graph uh, on the torus. There's, there's, there's the, you have one parameter for every face, but then the product of all those faces is, is, is the identity, is zero, uh, well, is one, and then there's the two extra generators for the gen homology of the torus. Okay, so these are the, this is the appropriate dimension of space uh, is appropriate, I mean, F plus one is the appropriate dimension where the 
true parameters, parameters lives. <coughs> okay. So now I want to tell you about the Poisson structure. And it's going to be on this, uh, this uh, space here, uh, which, which identify with the, uh, so th this is the space of, well, essentially the, the cycle space of the graph, which is F plus one dimensional. So, so this is generated by this, uh, well, really I should say H1 of the graph, so which is generated by uh, well, how do you generate the cycle space of the graph on the torus? You have the elementary cycles. So for every face of my graph, I have a I look at the, uh, I have a, a corresponding cycle, which is just the you know, counterclockwise cycle there, and I'm going to call that X sub F, where F is a face of the graph. Uh, and then I have two extra cycles, which are the cycles which wind around the torus horizontally and vertically. And then, I, uh, and then there's, let's call them uh, X sub horizontal and X sub vertical. So they correspond to the vertical, horizontal and vertical homology generators of the torus. And these have one relation, so one relation, which is that the, the, the product of these is equal to one. Or if you like, if you think of them as, as cycles, uh, if I cycle counterclockwise around every, uh, around every face, then every edge gets, gets is, is has once, goes once in each direction, so the sum is zero. One relation, which, and since we're working with, uh, in the product, form uh, the product of the x's over all the faces is 1. Okay, so how do you define the Poisson structure? Well, uh, it's a quadratic Poisson structure. And it comes from the intersection form on the on the conjugate surface. So we define uh, x uh, f1, x f2. If we have two faces, this is going to be epsilon some some uh, well, i j x f i x f j, where uh, epsilon i j is symmetric uh, and is the intersection form of the cycles on the on the conjugate surface surface uh, epsilon ij is the intersection form of the cycles well the cycles winding around the boundary of the i-th face and the j-th face. Uh, so let me say boundary fi and boundary fj on the conjugate surface uh, sigma. So on a surface, right, if you have two cycles, two oriented cycles, you can measure their intersection number, right? This is a skew-symmetric form, and, and you plug it into this. And this, this, whenever epsilon is skew-symmetric, this defines the uh, Poisson bracket. So J Jacobi identity follows from the. Is that okay? <laughs> so that's our that's our. Uh, well, I have to. Yeah. Oh. Okay. That's the definition. So now my now I have my space, which is this uh, 
space of uh, mm, line bundles on my graph. <laughs> and I've got a Poisson structure on that space. And uh, let's let's study study that for a second, for a moment. If if I've got two faces which are uh, adjacent to each other, so this is a you know F one and F two. This is on my torus. T2 here. Uh, when, when I, in the conjugate surface, the, the graphs are the same, but the, but the ribbon structure gets a little twist and so on. So the, uh, going around this face and going around that face, they, they actually have a non-zero non, non intersection. This, this cycle and this cycle, uh, when, when, you, when you put that little twist kink in the surface, that, that means they intersect. So uh, chi F1, chi F2, I mean, so epsilon 1, 2 here is, is 1, or maybe minus 1, depending on the, the uh, convention. Okay? If the faces are, are disjoint from each other, then they don't, then they don't, uh, don't, don't have any pairing. F1, F2 are adjacent. Uh, well, which, which I should put plus or minus one. And the sign depends on which vertex is, is white and which vertex is, is black. That's a con convention. Uh, on the other hand, suppose I have, uh, I can make another cycle which is a zigzag path, a zigzag path. Which is one that what that looks like this. Suppose I have a uh, in my in my graph on my torus in my graph gamma. Suppose I have a path which which uh, uh, every time I get to a black vertex I turn maximally right, and every time I get to a white vertex I turn maximally left. Right when I when I do the uh, when I look on the conjugate surface, let, let me explain one thing about this conjugate surface. That's, that's kind of important. If I, if I look at the surface from above, right, the, the, it's, a, it's still going to be an orientable surface, right? This is the sort of the up, up side of the surface, and this is the, the underneath the surface. So at every white vertex, you're seeing the surface from above, and at every black vertex, you're seeing it from below. So when I, when I turn uh, right at a black vertex, uh, sorry, that's black. <laughs> when I turn right at a black vertex, uh, well, I'm turning right on the conjugate surface. But when I'm turning left at a white vertex, I'm turning right at, a conjug uh, at the conjugate surface. So on the conjugate surface, this zigzag path makes uh, maximal right turns. So at every vertex, white or black, it's turning maximally right. And so it, it closes up to make a face. That is, the, the ribbon structure has a disk there and you, you, when you put that, when you put that uh, disk back in, it's a, it's a contractible curve. So a zigzag path on the original graph becomes a contractible curve on the conjugate surface once you glue it in. And, and therefore, it pairs trivially with everything in the Poisson bracket. A zigzag path uh, uh, pairs trivially with everything. So it's in the kernel of the Poisson structure. Well, let's call this zigzag path uh, gamma. Uh, so gamma x is zero 
for all x. So it's in the kernel of the Poisson bracket for every zigzag path. So going around a face pairs non-trivially with, with its neighbors, but these zigzag paths pair trivially with everything. Those, those, are, those are Casimir's in the underlying uh, Poisson structure. Okay. So, uh, so this implies that they are Casimirs. That's, that's the, in fact, the definition of a Casimir is something which is in the kernel of the Poisson structure. Okay, so now let me just state the theorem here. Uh, and there's one, you know, there's one more definition which I have to give, but I'll state the theorem first. So suppose, suppose gamma is minimal a minimal bipartite graph on T2, okay? Uh, uh, there's several parts. Uh, so there is one, first of all, which uh, this is gonna tell you how, the, where the Newton polygon comes from. So there is one zigzag path for each edge of n, the Newton polygon. Let me just write, write the whole thing and then I'll explain every, every little piece. Uh, so these, these, uh, well the, the, the variables associated with these zigzag paths generate the kernel of the Poisson structure. These zigzag paths generate the kernel of the Poisson structure right and uh, if I so these are the if I if I fix the fixing the uh, well so the space my space uh, which I don't know if I called it something h1 of the graph so is foliated by symplectic leaves uh, uh, defined by the level sets of the Casimirs, defined by level sets of Casimirs. That is, for every zigzag path, you have some variable. If you fix those variables to specific values, then the, you, you find yourself on a symplectic leaf uh, 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 of dimension two G, where G is the number of interior points of the polygon. And the Hamiltonians, which are the coefficients of Q, so the uh, coefficients coefficients of Z of this polygon, when normalized, plus on commute. And the uh, uh, interior coefficients uh, are Hamiltonians for it, therefore Hamiltonians for an in integrable dynamical system. The interior coefficients, of which they're exactly G, uh, uh, generate or uh, are Hamiltonians for a, uh, you know, for an integral system.
And so these interior coefficients, this is a polynomial. Each coefficient is a polynomial in the appropriate variables, the x's. And these, uh, uh, so everything is algebraic. Let, let me, let's just. You said you wanted to define something. You saw that maybe. Right. I have to tell you what minimal means. Uh, uh, this is not, not, not very. Well, minimal means that the picture that you have in your mind <laughs> is actually what's going on. Uh, so about, 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 this, about what the conjugate surface looks like. So gamma is minimal definition. If, well, it's a condition, it's a topological condition on, on where the zigzag paths, uh, how they intersect each other. So if uh, one, if a zigzag path one doesn't intersect itself, so it can't uh, it can't sort of uh, uh, intersect itself like that. And and uh, if if one a zigzag path doesn't intersect itself, and two two zigzag paths. can't uh, cross more than once, cross greater than or equal to two times uh, like this in, in a parallel sense. It's okay, it, uh, so this is in an anti-parallel sense, so yeah. So this is this one is okay and this one is not okay. Anyway, there's some te technical, somewhat technical looking condition, but uh, uh, it essentially means that when the the consequence of this is that when you make this conjugate surface and you glue in the disks, uh, the it's a, it's a the, the graph is properly embedded on the surface in the sense that every complementary component is a, is contractible. Yeah, so, so you don't want to have a surface which, uh, I mean, your graph has to fill the surface in the sense that every complementary component is a disk. Uh, so in the example, by the way, we had this, let's just do the example here. Our Newton polygon looked like this, right? There, are, there happen to be four uh, zigzag paths. There's one for each boundary uh, edge of the Newton polygon, so this is n. And for example, this, this edge here corresponds to the zigzag path which uh, goes up here like that. One, the, the direction of the zigzag path, the homology class of the zigzag path is the homology class of the difference of these two things. So let's see. So in this case, uh, right, there's, there's four zigzag paths, one for each edge of n. That's the first statement. Uh, they generate the kernel of the Poisson structure. So this, in this case, there's a, uh, the, space, the, the space H1 is five-dimensional, right, because I, got, I have four faces, plus two is six, minus one is five. The dimension of this guy is five, but there's, well, there's four Casimirs whose product is one that, that reduces the di dimension by three for the Casimirs. And so I'm left with a two-dimensional space, which is two times the number of interior vertices. <laughs> and so that's the content of the <laughs> sections two and three is that the, uh, once I fix the level sets of the Casimirs by choosing my parameters so that the, the, the alternating, the, the curvatures along the, the monodromies along the zigzag paths are fixed, fixed values, then, well, this is, at least generically, the, the level set is a 2G dimensional space 
uh, where g is the number of interior points. And in this, in this, in this example, it's not very interesting because there's only one Hamiltonian, but uh, if, if I have a more complicated graph, I can have many uh, interior points. And, and I get a higher dimensional uh, integrable system. So there's something, uh, none of this is very hard. The, 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 the only sort of hard part is to show that these Hamiltonians commute. I mean, everything else is sort of straightforward, and that involves a little bit of combinatorics, which uh, I mean, you can imagine that, that each, each, well, each of the coefficients of this polynomial is a sum of dimer covers, which has a particular homology class, and then by doing some combinatorics on those, on those two, two sets of dimer covers, one for one coefficient, one for another coefficient, and plugging it in, you can, you can show this commutivity, commutativity. Well, one thing I didn't have time to tell you is, is how you go back. I told you how, if you start with a graph on a torus, you can make this polygon, uh, uh, but actually the, it goes the other way as well. You start with your favorite polygon here, convex polygon, you can make a graph, uh, but there are some choices involved along the way. And uh, in, in, if you look at, if you go through all possible choices, you get a finite set of graphs, finite set of minimal graphs. So, uh, and then from each of those, you can, you can but, but the, the theorem uh, is that each of those graphs are related to each other by some simple local transformations. And let me just, to finish, let me just draw the local transformation uh, uh, here. Uh, well, um, if I have a graph which has a face of degree four, you know, in it, this is on my torus, gamma and it may be connected to the rest of the graph. Then I can replace, then I can replace that with a, uh, a uh, face of degree, degree four with four legs. And in fact, maybe it's, where's my eraser go? Let me do it this way. Sorry, I'm gonna start over here. Suppose I find myself in a configuration like this, then I can transform that into this configuration, right, which is topologically distinct, but uh, the the there's an there's an underlying Poisson map of the of the, the my various variables. If we got variables associated to these these faces here. All the, all the variables stay the same except for these five get transformed in some algebraic way and the, that, that gives you a, a Poisson isomorphism between this, this structure and that structure there. And the theorem is that the, uh, the set of graphs you obtain this way are all, if they have the same Newton polygon, they, then they're all related to each other by a sequence of these moves. Then the partition function is the same. Yes. The partition function, well, I mean, they're not the same because they're written in different variables. That after that exchange, they're in different variables. So really, the underlying uh, uh, algebraic integral system is going to be the same. So, so the, the partition function can be reconstructed in the first case. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, it's, it's hard, though, because, uh, I mean, here you don't see where the variables are. In order to sort of put the variables in some sort of geometric position, you, you make a particular graph, but then, uh, yeah, any other graph that you build the same way, there's a way to relate it to the original one. So I don't, I don't, I don't know how to go directly from here to here without first drawing some graph. Also, uh, if you know the integral of systems, also, uh, it's, it's on the edge of, 
preloading the global system and then you want to well, yeah th yes th <laughs> that's that is also possible to do i mean if if you write down the list of hamiltonians in in some nice coordinates right it's just a list of polynomials then uh, there are various ways there, it is there is some algorithm to reconstruct the graph but it involves inverting some some matrices but uh, I don't know if, if you hand me an integrable system I don't know how to recognize that it comes from this particular construction if it does come from this construction then I can do the reconstruction but uh, this, is, this does not give you every integrable system <laughs> Thank you for listening.